Okay, you're done. All of the hard work is done, and now it's mission accomplished. So what's next? Because with your degree from ITI, you'll have the tools you need to have a better life. And the reason we do this is you. We want to foster your dreams, your plans, and the hope for your future with a quality education. Our tagline is for a better life, so you can actually live the life you've always dreamed of. And it can all begin here at ITI, where we're invested in your future. I'm Lee Feinswag, and this is Sports 225. And not just any Sports 225. This is the 25th year of the show. We started with Sports Monday, continued it into Sports 225, and now, a quarter century later, here we are. Sports 225 is sponsored by Breck. And now, me. This time it's real. This is like one of those uh, Apollo missions where they had, they had this, they got stuck on the launch pad. There was a hole in the count. Exactly. Uh, good evening. I'm Lee Feinswag. This is the Techno Mess. It is Sports 225. And thanks to Nils Breckoff from Your View and Cox Communications for bailing us out right now. Um, but we're here. And Scott Rabelais is here, too. You heard us chit-chatting. He is, of course, the columnist for The Advocate and is the most powerful sports writer in all of Louisiana now with the merger. You like that? that I just made that up, but I like that. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know how to take that, but I, I, I do. <laughs> it is weird. People say, you know, like if they have a New Orleans tie. They say, you know, this Scott Rabelais with the, with the New Orleans Advocate, the Times Picayune. It's like I never thought it'd be with the Times Picayune, but yeah, we we merged and Nola dot com and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's uh, no, it's, it's good a, because it's a you have a, a bigger audience and more resources. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah we do. So it's. Uh, Things are going as well as they can go in journalism these days for us, so it's, it's fortunate. No, it is good. And uh, so, um, not to dwell too much, but this is the start, of, or the, you know, we're the third show in of the 25th season of what was Sports Monday and now Sports 225. We started with Paul Maneri, the first show, and then Ron Higgins was here, and Scott Rabelais here now. And, of course, I have to say this almost every time he's on, but he was the first guest of the first show in September of 1995. Is that amazing? And that that is a, seems like a long time ago. Yes. We've been through a lot of life stuff, you know, in that <laughs> time, true. the two of us combined. That's you know? very true. Yes. Well, anyway, so I wanted Scott to come on for a number of reasons. One, because I like being with him, and two, because he's a great guest, and three, it's, uh, you know, L the LSU football re season really opens this Saturday at Texas. Um, so uh, LSU played Georgia Southern and came away with a 55-3 to victory. Texas beat... Louisiana Tech, which didn't score till the fourth quarter, 45-14. Is there any difference between those two outcomes in essence? Not that much, other than the fact that uh, Louisiana Tech did gain a lot of yards. Uh, they had like 25 first downs and over 400 yards of offense. LSU held Georgia Southern to under 100. That's a team that ra rushed for 260 a game last year. Um, the, the, one, the comparison I, I would draw, too, is that they lost to Clemson 38-7 to last year. Georgia, Georgia Southern did at Clemson. So... And, of course, they went on to win the national title. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty comparable. I mean, Texas a was never in any trouble, and LSU obviously controlled the game from, from the outset. So pretty well, I, comparable teams. Yeah. I was in Austin last weekend, and uh, it's really hot. If you're going to the game, there's a couple of things that are important to know. Number one, it's going to be really hot. And, if you, you know, you heard me talk with uh, Matt Moscona earlier this week when we were on the radio, and he goes, yeah, but it's going to be it's a night game. The sun goes down. Okay, so it goes from 102 to 97 when the sun yeah, goes down. Yeah, it's going to be about 97 yeah. at kickoff. That's yeah. pretty warm. Number two, it's, it's a really fun city with tons of restaurants, but it's a really big, crowded city, and everybody wants to go to those restaurants. So if you're going there, get reservations. Now, <laughs> and if you're a beer drinker like me, it's great, great beer stuff. You've been there before? I've been a couple of times for uh, volleyball back when I was a student working in the sports information office, and they played in their old Gregory Gym. Yeah, um, they still play there, and they still sell it out. Yeah, it, it was kind of a neat old place. And I went the year that Pokey Chapman stepped down, and, they, and Bob Starkey became the interim coach. They played the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament that year in, in Austin at the Irwin Center. Mm. And, of course, they went on to the Final Four. They beat UConn. Still the best game I ever saw the LSU women play against a quality opponent. Beat the beat the. It's not out of Thank UConn. you for not saying that. Yeah, I know. You know, yeah, you very, know very that work. in the history of, of our show, in the 25 years, mm -hmm. you and I, and on the same show, are the only two people I've ever had to beep out. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All those years. That's a uh, one time, somebody on live TV 
let a, a barnyard, ep, has, what's that word? Epi, epithet. Epithet slip. But, you know, there's nothing you could do. It was on live. And, um, yeah, so it's pretty funny. You and I both. And we, and we were laughing, at, you know, because we realized what we had done. I don't know if you remember that. but So you went there for hoops and volleyball. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the old volleyball coach for Texas at the time when you went was Mick Haley. Mick Haley. Who, who, uh, I, who was there actually watching that game. And we had dinner mm -hmm. after the game, after the volleyball match that mm -hmm. I was there for this past Saturday. Um, and Mark Rosner, you remember him, the sports writer? Did, we, did you know Mark? No. Okay, well, anyway, he was there. We I got, got to hook up with him. Anyway, enough about Lee and Scott's old home week in Austin. Um, it's, a, it's a big stadium, but it's not an overwhelming stadium uh, like uh, a Tiger Stadium, if you will. You know? It's a big horseshoe. Uh, yeah. Shape Stadium, and, the, and the tickets are at a premium, obviously. A it's ticket. A, a big game, right? Six and nine the, or whatever, right? Yeah, it, yeah, six versus nine. They're saying in Austin it's the biggest non-conference game, home game they've had since Ohio State came in 2006. So it's uh, it's it's a very big deal for 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 them, and you know the Texas is trying to come you know come back from the you know the doldrums. The, the Charlie Strong era was you know kind of being lost in the wilderness, and then and then LSU is trying to you know get back to LSU's never completely faded away, of course, but they're trying to get back to national prominence. Last year, finished sixth in the polls, won the Fiesta Bowl. And the winner of this game really propels themselves into the national championship conversation. The loser is not out of it because Texas could beat Oklahoma and r somehow run the table, and LSU could beat Alabama and run the table, but uh, that's a much tougher feat to, to, to accomplish. I, th I really think if LSU can win this game and only lose to Alabama, they're still in the national ch championship picture. The, the chances are still there for them to make the, the college football playoff. Well, you said something really interesting there about national prominence, and that's why I want to go to break and come back and pick up with that as mm -hmm. soon as we can. Uh, Scott Rabelais is here. You can read him at uh, Rabelais ADV on Twitter. Of course, read his stuff at theadvocate.com, at nola.com, and um, see him on this show at least uh, twice a year <laughs> somehow, some way. I'm Lee Feinberg, and this is Sports and People Live. Back out of the chaos. All right, we're back on Sports 225, hanging out with Scott Rabelais. And one of the things he said in the last segment that I said I would go to afterwards, and hey, how about that? If you watch the show, for me to remember from one segment to the next, you know, I usually say that and then never go back. Talked about national prominence. All right, so LSU finished sixth in the nation last year in the polls, opens this season at six and still six. Texas is ninth. How much more national prominent can you get? Do you have to be in that final four and play for the national championship, either the semifinals or the final, to be nationally prominent? I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm just saying that there's this perception. I mean, my gosh, there's, you know, how many, you know, BCS eligible teams are there? Like 125 or something? About that, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's become the, the goal now. You know, right. It's, well, of course. It, it's, uh, and, and, of course, last year, LSU's trip to the Fiesta Bowl was the first time under this new format, which started about five years ago. That LSU made it to the New Year's Six, you know, one of those bowls that is in the rotation for the national semifinals. And so now the goal is to try to get in, in, in the playoff. And, of course, then win and <laughs> win the national championship game, which is in New Orleans, which means LSU is going, okay? Because the last three times right, right. they played for the national title in New Orleans, LSU was in the game. So um, uh, it's... Uh, it's it's the next step, you know, what you're trying to achieve and what everyone's aiming for now. And it has taken a little bit of luster off of other things, but this is the, this is the format now that they're, they're at, until they go to eight teams or something, like that, which it probably will one day. I, yeah, this contract goes, what, till 2020, I wanted to say 23 or something, mm -hmm. this current contract. Um, it, was 12 year, it was a 12-year deal to start, yeah. this is like year five. So. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're so stubborn about this. I mean, you know, uh, Eight. If you have eight, somebody will complain about not being nine, you know, about being nine. I mean, you know, whatever. But but four doesn't seem enough. But to your point, certainly you would think that um, uh, the, if the, the other team in the SEC only has one loss, like, and, and it even works to your advantage to, to not be from the other division. Because if you lose in, yeah. the, in, the, in the SEC championship game, 
that's probably not as good as losing to Alabama if you're in the West Division it, it, and not going to the SEC. Exactly. Division. Georgia was in, the, the, was in a similar position to what I described last year. Mm -hmm. They lost to LSU here. They won the SEC East, made it to the championship game, blew the lead to Alabama, and then they were left out. You know, so that was, you know, the, you know so you are, but what you're saying is if you were undefeated in the regular season, 12 0, then lost the SEC championship game. Yeah, it, it, losing at the end probably is going to hurt you as compared to losing in September. Yeah. But to take me down memory lane a little bit, it's funny how you said that about uh, New Orleans. So when LSU won its first national championship since 1958, 2003, yes. with Nick Saban, and that was in the Superdome, mm -hmm. uh, I remember just uh, thinking to myself how incredibly athletic and quick and powerful the defense was on that team. There were so many great players. And then you know, for, for, for LSU fans who have waited you know, almost 50 years for a national championship to come back and get another one, um, so few years later, also in New Orleans. Right. And then the team that, that lost in uh, two th the 2011 season, I've always maintained that going into that championship game against Alabama was the best college football team in the history of college football because of who they beat and who they had on that team and would have cemented that place had they crossed midfield. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, I, and they lost that game to really, when, it was funny, you know, recently Mike Gundy, the Oklahoma State coach, said, ah, we would have won the championship game. They lost at Iowa on a state on a Friday night. And I remember, you know, you know, looking back on it, it's like, that's when LSU lost because I think they would have beaten Oklahoma State in the final. They would have picked an undefeated Oklahoma State team to go against an undefeated, uh, a, a, well, a two, a undefeated LSU team. They had two losses in 07. But it's uh, it's crazy how things go. I'm gonna write some. I'm writing something in the paper this week about 1936. Uh, LSU went to Texas and law and was in a 6-6 tie, and they wound up number two in the very first AP poll behind a one-loss Minnesota team and uh, wound up in the Sugar Bowl where they lost. But back then, the polls were, the titles were awarded and the polls were decided before the bowl games. So LSU probably would have gone to the Rose Bowl, which they'd never been to, and they probably would have won the first AP national title. But for this 6-6 this six -six tie against a Texas team that finished last of the Southwest Conference mm. that year, and LSU had a great team. They, they were... They were true. They led the nation in scoring. Twenty-eight points a game, Lee. They led the nation in scoring that year. <laughs> Twenty-eight. Now, now that's like a halftime score in the Big Twelve. Right. Well, you know, do you remember um, in 1968, which of course you'd been two. What year were you born? Sixty-six. Yeah, so you wouldn't remember this course, <laughs> but so the poll. Um, Richard Nixon said that Texas should be number one. Sixty-nine. Was, Sixty-nine. 69 yeah. Texas and and Penn State, I believe it was, and he said no, Texas should be number one. And so people had voted, and Texas was given the myth. They used to call it the mythical national championship. Yeah, because uh, yeah. they were. It was just the wire surf. Now, now it's still it's still kind of, you know, myth, it's still not the NCAA championship. You know, the NCAA football champion is the FCS champion, the the North Dakota states of the world. You yeah, know, yeah, that sort of thing. So, um, and uh, you know, the, the, you have the CFP because the the. Uh, the big schools don't want to share the money with the NCAA. They don't have to share the money with the NCAA. No, but that goes back to your point about why it's got to be at least eight teams, you know, uh, playing for the national. I, I think it's okay the way it is, but you know, we've seen every other playoff expand. I think this one probably will too. The problem is, where do you play the round of eight? Where do you play those games? Do you play on campus? Do you play in other bowl games? I don't, I don't think you can ask people to go to three bowl games in a row. The fans, yeah, you know, yeah. they're just not going to going to do it. So. It, it and and it, that, that becomes a bit problematic because some stadiums like shut down. Uh, someone told me like Penn State they turned the water off in the stadium in Penn State because the pipes could freeze. You know after after the last game in November, so you got to restart all that. Well, you, you know I mean there's a lot of logistical issues. People are, don't really contemplate when they say I'll oh, just expand the playoff to, to eight teams. So. Things that I never thought that I would hear today and learn about and the pipes. <laughs> And the water being shut off at Penn State, hmm. Beaver Stadium. That's right. I'm going there in two weeks. Not I've for football. I've never been there. I would like to go. It's a very, um, it's a remotely beautiful place. Yeah. But it's out in the middle of nowhere. Well, yeah. Facilities are unbelievable. I mean, a hockey rink stadium for the hockey teams. You know, soccer stadiums. Of course, the football stadium's huge, and you know they sell out every game and on and on. All right, hold that thought. Um, we got to take this break. We'll be back with Scott Rabelais. I'm Lee Fontaine. It's Sports Two Two Five.
break out of the routine. Two shoe, two rows. Um, I'm Lee Feinswag at Sports 225. Scott Rabelais is here with me. Uh, the best things sometimes are what you don't hear. In between the segments, um, you spent a lot of time, obviously, with the LSU football team. Um, you know, uh, in, the, in the three minutes you get to see of uh, practices, and, um, but actually you're lucky the practices are closed because who wants to be out in this heat? Oh, no, I don't want to be out there for no. two hours. No, no absolutely not. <laughs> That's for beat writers, young, young, young kids. Right. Yeah. I do go to practice just about every day, but yeah, wouldn't want to do that. Who, who have you interviewed and been around on the team this year who impresses you as like you say, wow, this kid's really uh, interesting to talk to or you, know, you, you find yourself rooting for him because you like the way he handles himself? Offensive linemen are usually interesting to talk to, uh, and uh, Garrett Brumfield last year, was, for example, was a, he talked to you about all kinds of stuff, whether the earth is flat or not, and things like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, Burrow is kind of like that. You know, he, he's, he's, he's got, got enough cocky cerebralness to make you want to go, hmm, I, yeah, I'm surprised he thinks of that. Uh, Richard Lawrence is, 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 a, is a personal favorite. Uh, you know, the offensive lineman, uh, defensive lineman. He was. Uh, he came back for his, his senior year, came, coming off a, a knee uh, injury, and had to come back. And, and he's a he's a big teddy bear of a kid. He he came to media day last year. He, I think he was disappointed they didn't ask him back this year. He was he, he loved it. it. Was like I can't. How do you love coming to this thing? Um, one one kid I'm I'm happy for is Thaddeus Moss. You know he's the you know the son of Randy Moss, the you know Hall of Fame NFL wide receiver. Was at NC State, transferred to LSU. Had to sit out a year. Then last year he got hurt in, in, in preseason. You know, they're just doing their off-season work and, and you know, uh, had an injury. Never came back. Had to sit out. So he sat out two whole years. And he had two big catches in the, uh, in the Georgia Southern game. And, you, you, know, you know, football means so much to these kids. You know, I mean, you have to be really dedicated, as all college athletes are. Yeah, but, but, I mean, but, still. but, I mean, he's gone through a lot of pain and, and, uh, and, and personal, you know, you know, uh, Turmoil to get to play again. So it was, it was, I was, and, and he's he's a good kid to interview. I, I've I've enjoyed talking with him. But uh, those those are a couple of favorite. Oh, and I always like the kickers too. You know, like, oh, Zach a- von Rosenberg is almost as old as me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I miss that was one thing about Media Day, which you know they conveniently just got away from a few years ago during yeah. the, after the floods, and then we've just they've just gone away. There is no more Media Day, yeah. and it was always fun. I could always count on going to talk to the place kickers and the punters and the snappers and getting a, a really funny good segment. You know, that was something that I always enjoyed. Yeah, it's kind of like Super Bowl Media Day, which is a total oh. farce. Oh. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a day where you could talk to anybody and every, you know, everyone on the field. And, um, you know, I, I think they don't really like certain players to have to talk. Yeah, <laughs> Especially well. if they're having some kind of off-the-field yeah. issues. Well, there are things that are just, you know, um, freshmen don't get to do interviews. Uh, you know, we get, we, we get notified, like, when practice will end now at 6.12, uh, media access begins at 5.57, enter the side, you know, it's like, really, seriously, you know. It's a big deal, it's big time business now, but it's, it's still, they still co- it's college kids. They still should open, media should be able to watch practice, everybody should be able to watch practice. It, it's like, you know, what, what, what do you got, you know? There's a wonderful documentary that started Tuesday night on the SEC Network about the history of it, f- football in the South, because it's the 150th year mm-hmm. of football. And uh, I think I'm supposed to be in it at some point. I know I'm not, not bringing that up because of that, but, but uh, they were talking about some of the shenanigans from the early days of college football. Like they, Georgia Tech came to play at Auburn, and they greased the track so that the train ran five miles past the town, and they had to walk back. The Georgia Tech players had to walk back <laughs> to, get, to, get, to, get, to, get to Auburn. I mean, you know, stuff like that. You know, just, you know, it, it's, uh, it reminds yeah, it's still, it was, that's how it started, you know, it was kind of, yeah, a, yeah. if you watch rugby today, that's what college football looked like 150 years ago. Leather helmets, there you go. Of course, rugby players barely wear them. Some of them wear the concussion types. Um, now, I had a thought there, and then you got me thinking about the train sliding an extra five miles. <laughs> that's a wonderful um, story. Scott Rabelais is with me. Of course, you can read his stuff at theadvocate.com, nola.com. Follow him at Rabelais, ADV. You're, you're not a prolific tweeter. You're a prolific retweeter. I like to retweet. I give people their due. You do. I, sometimes I'll, I'll tweet a lot during a press conference or during a game or something like that. But uh, bursts of of Twitter activity and stuff like that. And I try to keep politics out of it too. So you know, sometimes I you know I was like, I really want to have something to say about this, but I think people. I try to remember. A lot of people come to sports for an escape as, as much as it can be. And it's a lot of real world stuff in sports co- coverage now. 
So yeah, well, I, I just try to stick to the stick to the facts. Man. I remember what I was thinking about while you were talking about Young Moss. Well, has there been a Randy Moss sighting? Number one and number two. How about fourteen receivers catching passes? Do you ever remember that? Well, they had 14 players caught passes all last year. So 14 players caught passes in this game wow. in, uh, alone. So no, it, it, in one game, no, it was unheard of. And, and Burrow said he wasn't trying to spread the ball around. It just he's finding you know openings in the in the defense with this new offense. And they ran the offense they said they were going to. I know there was skepticism, but I mean, it really, really was this spread uh, RPO offense. And uh, no, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen Randy Moss. Uh, you know, I think he's involved in his son's life, and he's. Or, you know, probably around sometimes, but he doesn't make it like uh, when Carl Malone's son was an offensive lineman on the team. He was there all the time. You know, you'd say, you know, it's Carl Malone at football practice. You know, it's kind of, kind yeah, of, yeah, kind of yeah. different. You know, but uh, you know, some you know, some some ultra famous athletes they try to be more low profile, and maybe that's what he's doing. Unless they play like in L.A. You know, right. You know, whatever. <laughs> There's more people at like a USC game on the sidelines than there are. At, you know, whatever. It looks like a small army, and that's during the game. All right. Zion but, Williamson was at the game. Exactly. Oh, the other day, yeah. yeah I saw exactly that somewhere on social media. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, that, that, that one video that was going around where he tossed a football the, the length of a basketball court. Was mm -hmm. it a football? And it went through the hoop with, when he was there with <laughs> Drew Brees or whatever. You know, whatever. anyway. All right, so uh, we got, we got to take a break. we got one short segment left. Um, and we'll finish up with Scott Rabelais, the advocate. I'm Lee Fine Talk. Back out of the chaos. Coming down the home stretch of another Sports 225. Thanks to Scott Rabelais, of course, for being here, but I'll thank him again at the end of the show. Go to sports225.com to get all the show listings of when we're on Cox Sports Television CST or Your View, the former Cox 4. And thanks to Nils Breckoff from Cox for helping us out today and pushing all the buttons and getting us rolling. Um, LSU goes to Texas. And we talked a little bit about it in the first segment, but what do you expect out of that football game? You know, Notice it, how I said that like a football announcer. We expect out of that football game. Very good. Yeah. yeah very good. Um, it's, it's a tough game. I mean, it's you know, 102,000 people. It's going to be 102,000 degrees. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's some place they haven't been before. Else, you haven't played this since 1954, so it's not like when they go to Auburn every other year, there's some familiarity or something. Uh, they got a good quarterback in Sam Ellinger. Uh, they don't have, they're very thin at running back. They have one scholarship running back playing right now. And they lost a lot of players off of their defense from last year, a team that made it to the Big 12 title game and beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. Um, I, think, I, I think it's a game LSU can win. I, 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 at first I thought it was going to be really close. I, I think LSU could maybe like pull away and win by a couple of scores. I know that sounds a little bit crazy maybe to some people, but I think LSU, people at LSU think their defense might actually be better than it was last year with Greedy Williams and Devin White. And uh, they're better on the defensive line. They got some, you know, some good linebackers, of course. It's a good secondary. They'll, they'll be tested, but I, I think LSU is. I think LSU is going to win this one if they play crisply, like they did the other day. No turnovers, not a lot of penalties, that sort of thing. Um, when Tom Herman was out there from the University of Houston, and there was a bidding war going on for him, and he went to Texas, I, I had bells going off in my head that this guy's not a good long-term hire. I didn't have anything necessarily to justify that on, but it was just you know sometimes you have these gut feelings. Of course, at the same time, I wasn't thinking that Ed Ogeron was a good long-time hire as well, and he, he's done fabulous, and Herman seems to, have think, seems to have turned things around in a positive way there at Texas. Yeah, and, and he's still trying to build, and I think maybe Ogeron's program is a little ahead of the game because things had never really fallen off the cliff with less miles, you know, you know I mean, right. just weren't quite winning as much as they wanted to. But uh, yeah, he's a good coach. I, I never, but in terms of that, I never thought... He would come here and want to stay here long term. That he wanted to go somewhere else. He had no ties whatsoever to Louisiana. He'd coached a lot mm -hmm. in his career in Texas, even though he's from Ohio, and recruited Joe Burrow to Ohio State. By the way, yeah, calls him Joey Burrow because that's that's what they call him in uh, back home. Joey, Joey Burrow. He's Joey. So, um, but yeah, it, it, this just it just didn't seem like a great fit. And Ed Orgeron, obviously, if he's successful, he's never going to leave. No, yeah. absolutely. All right. Well, Scotty Rabelais. You, uh, <laughs> I do have to leave. <laughs> no, he's he's uh, one of my favorite guys. 
off the off the camera and on camera is a great guest, and I appreciate it. And he went above and beyond today to be here, so I am forever indebted. I was here early. He was a whole minute. I'm Lee Feinswag. Thanks for watching Sports Two Two Five. Good night. At Carnival Time by Baton Rouge Bay, that's the site of my story. At Spanish Town Mardi Gras, things can get blurry. See the moors marching, prizes fill the sky. This Spanish Town Mardi Gras.